Hello, Jill. Thank you so much for coming. Uh, thank you for everybody that's joining us later on in the recording of this session. We're really excited to have Michael Finn with us here today, who is a current student at Seminary of the Southwest and was a, a is an alumni of the Wyoming Service Corps program. And so we're just really glad to have Michael here sharing on this topic today. And I will pass it along to you, Michael. Awesome. Yeah. So welcome everybody. Uh, so this presentation is essentially about LGBTQ plus affirming churches. Uh, and so I'll get right into it. So introductions. So I will briefly introduce myself before I get into it. Um, so obviously my background, I am Christian, obviously. <laughs> I am attending Seminary in the Southwest. And then the other part of this, I guess that might be obvious, is that I am a member of the LGBT community. Um, and so this work is deeply important to me personally. And also this is support work that I've done previously. I did work that was very similar to this for St. John's Church in Powell. And then the other aspect of this is this is my lived experience and also that's something that I draw from. And I also draw from the experience of my loved ones who identify as many different things, uh, transgender, lesbian, gay, what have you. Um, and this is also something that I've read about, studied and lived. And so that's sort of my background, why I'm doing this, why this is important to me. Um, and the other thing is like, please know that this is absolutely a safe space for questions. Um, you know, ask your weird, maybe poorly worded questions, and I only ask that you come with sincerity, and then I will help you to my knowledge of the right answer. All right, and then I thought I would give a brief outline just to maybe put the entire presentation in context as we go through it. So the first part of this presentation will deal with terminology that I think would be helpful for you all to know in going forward and being an affirming church or otherwise just existing as an informed person in society today. The second part of this presentation will deal with a little bit of queer Christianity, um, touching upon the clobber passages and also touching upon how to be more affirmational and affirmational passages. And the third part will deal with uh, sort of basic outlines, basic steps to becoming a more affirming church. All right, so this is part one, just helpful information you should know. All right, so this is sort of a rhetorical question. Uh, who is your first crush? And so if you'll take a second just to remember that and remember what it felt like, um, I will talk about mine because I find it very funny and I've actually spoken to Alan about this. This is one of our first conversations actually now that I think about it. Um, so my first crush was actually uh, from a movie called The Lightning Thief which was also a book that I read as a child and it was on the main character. He was the hero type you know sword and armor and all that and that was just you know 10 year old Michael was just very enamored with that. So you might be asking why I'm asking this. And so the reason why I'm asking this partly is just to highlight that talking about sexual orientation is normal. Um, your first crush isn't something that's profane and brash. It's something that's a part of everyday life that is entirely mundane and normal. And sexual orientation is part of our everyday lives. It's in our marriages, it's in our society just in general. And so it's not something that's taboo to talk about. All right, so now getting into the LGBT terminology. So I think we all know much more than we think we do. And I will highlight that by saying most people can probably get define each letter in the LGBT acronym, you know? And so in case you don't know, I'll hit the bullet points really quickly. Lesbian, gay, bisexual, and transgender are the LGBT. And so lesbian and gay refer to a person that is attracted to this gender that they were, that they express. So lesbians are women attracted to women and gay is men attracted to men. Gay also can be used as an umbrella term for any member of the LGBT community. And that is something that you will see quite commonly 
in phrases like the gay community. Um, bisexual is traditionally understood as an attraction to two or more genders, traditionally male and female, but it's taken on a lot of nuances and can mean just an attraction to people regardless of gender. Uh, transgender typically traditionally refers to somebody who expresses a gender and is a gender identity that they were not, that doesn't align with the sex that they were assigned at birth. Um, sorry, I mumbled, I jargled that a little bit, so I'll say it again. Somebody whose gender identity does not match the sex that they were assigned at birth. And we will talk more about what gender and what sex mean in just a minute, but sit tight. And so the Q, can mean two different things. One of the things that the Q can mean is questioning, which refers to somebody who is questioning their identity, whether that be their sexuality or their gender identity. And we will talk more about sexuality and gender identity in a few slides. And the plus is there to refer to, uh, to indicate that not everyone is represented by the letters of this acronym. The human experience is vast, wide, and complicated. And yeah. And the other thing that the Q can stand for is queer, uh, which is an interesting word. Uh, it's a reclaimed slur. Uh, and so there are many different reasons for reclaiming this, many different ways to use it, but it is typically used as an umbrella term. And what I will say right now, because I don't necessarily need to get into the reasons why it's being reclaimed as a slur, what I will let you know is that I think it is best practice if you are not in the LGBT community to refrain from using the word queer unless it's in the title of something or something of that nature. All right, other helpful terms that I think you should know are sexual orientation, which is an inherent or immutable, enduring, emotional, romantic, or sexual attraction to other people. Gender identity, which is the innermost concept of identity for a person, and this can encompass masculinity, femininity, both, neither, and many things. Gender expression is the outward expression of a person's gender identity, encompassing appearance, behavior, and other characteristics. Gender dysphoria is a sense of unease that a person may have because of a mismatch between their biological sex and their gender identity. I put this term in here because, in my experience, um, a lot of young people can experience gender dysphoria in places and communities that refuse to recognize their gender identity or in families where a gender expression that doesn't match their gender identity is forced upon them. And so this isn't gender dysphoria from my community and usage is not just a mismatch between their biological sex and gender identity. It's often triggered by unsupportive communities. And then sex is a physical description of a person's anatomy, typically assigned at birth by a doctor or midwife, and it is distinct from gender. And so I also wanted to have a note about this term because in modern society, we don't necessarily need to know about sex outside of a medical term and something that a lot of people take some time to think about and meditate on is the differentiation between gender and sex, because for most people, they are the same. But for many people, many of our loved ones, they are not the same. And we need to recognize that gender is more critical to the people that we care about rather than their sex. And a lot of these terms are very similar in their first go, but they do have lots of distinctions and whatnot. So. All right, so other terms that I have encountered that I think would be helpful is sex assigned at birth. And so this is the sex, typically male or female, that a doctor or midwife uses to describe a child at birth based on their external anatomy. And this is where we get terms like assigned female at birth and assigned male at birth. And the reason I put this in the PowerPoint is because I have used this term a lot and a lot of my loved ones use this term to describe exactly what it is, their sex that they were assigned at birth. Now, does this come up super often? No, but it's very helpful for talking about a very sensitive issue, which is biological sex, because as we saw, gender dysphoria is a real issue. And so this helps put sex in its place. It helps distance it from 
a gender identity, which is the more important thing. And so non-binary is another term that I have used and have seen used very often. And it's an adjective describing a person who does not identify exclusively as a man or a woman. And these people may identify as being both a man and a woman, somewhere in between, or as falling completely outside of these categories. Um, and gender nonconforming is a similar but distinct term. And this is a broad term referring to people who do not behave in a way that conforms to the traditional expectations of their gender, or whose gender expression does not fit neatly into a category. So I think what differentiates these two terms if this is helpful, is that non-binary refers to an identity and gender non-conforming can go beyond just identity. It goes into things like how someone may dress that isn't traditional for their gender or even taking on gender roles that are not traditionally expectations for their gender. So we could say that men who stay home to take care of their children are gender non-conforming. Obviously, we might not use that word like that, but I think that's a good illustration of how these terms are different. And the other term that I have encountered a lot is trans, um, just shortened, not transgender the entire word, but shortened to just trans. And I've seen this used as an umbrella term for people whose gender identity and expression is different from cultural expectations based on the sex they are assigned at birth. So obviously it is very similar to the word transgender, but I think the differentiation here is that transgender is very heavily associated with somebody who has transitioned from a societal view of the gender or sex they were assigned at birth to a gender identity that they fit. And trans doesn't have that connotation. It just is an umbrella term for anyone whose gender identity is different from cultural expectations based on the sex they are assigned at birth. That can be a little confusing, and a lot of these terms do overlap a lot. And something that takes getting used to, that takes some time to meditate on, is that a lot of these terms have overlap, and that doesn't make any one term better than the other. These terms are important to different people, and different people will resonate with different terms. And it doesn't take much for us to honor that, you know, that there are a variety of terms, terms out there because the human experience is vast and wide and we want to show love. And so using the terms that make people comfortable are a way to show them love. All right, so that is all the terminology I will give to you in this presentation. I tried to keep it as short as I could because I didn't want to overwhelm and overload. And so there are many other terms that I could have covered and gone in depth with and explained to you that are also very important valid terms, but I just tried to really boil it down to a basic toolbox of things that you could use to just know and talk about with potential members of your communities. So in part two, I'm going to talk a little bit about queer Christianity. Um, this is the part where I will get into the clobber passages, which are a bummer, frankly. <laughs> and I think the note that I wanted to have here is that to, for me, interpreting these clobber passages are not a way to combat the hate and everything. For me, and my intention with this is to give you the tools to show love to people who might have been hurt or are being hurt by these passages. Um, and the other thing is, I am doing a very basic analysis of these clobber passages. I think each one will get probably 30 to 45 seconds of analysis because there are many resources and scholars who are going to be able to do it much deep, more deeply and richly than I will. And so I will give you the basics, and if you want to know and learn more, um, I can point you in the right direction. But first, something that I want you to be considering as we talk about this is what do LGBTQ plus kids struggle with in your community? Um, I ask this because times have changed. Frankly, a lot of stuff for queer kids has gotten better over the last years and decades. However, it's not perfect. And so I want to highlight that the basic difference that I understand from 
my lived experience and my reading and whatnot is it's become much less covert in terms of I don't think a lot of LGBTQ plus kids are getting beat up anymore in schools and in whatnot and in the, their communities. I do think it's much more covert. It's what comes to mind is when I was in high school and gay marriage was getting debated nationally, having to debate other students about my rights as a gay person in the country. That is a very hurtful and strange and covert kind of struggle that is difficult to explain. And it's things like social isolation or unsupportive or tolerant but not affirming communities. You know, we won't hate you because you're gay. We just won't sit with you or talk to you or, you know, that kind of thing. So kind of a bummer question, but something to really be thinking about as you begin to engage with this ministry. All right, so on to another bummer, which are the clobber passages. So traditionally, there are thought to be seven clobber passages, and these are the lists. We'll get into them, so I'm not going to list them all for you right now. Um, and if you don't know what the clobber passages are, these are clobbered, the LGBT community. So that's where they get their name. Like, yeah. So Genesis 19, 1 through 11, known, I think, popularly as the Sodom and Gomorrah story. I put a little snippet of it here. Um, Before they had gone to bed, all the men from every part of the city of Sodom, both young and old, surrounded the house. They called to Lot, where are the men who came to you tonight? Bring them out to us so that we can have sex with them. Gross. Um, (laughs) So in this, we get a lot of biblical evidence that the homosexuality referred to in this story is immaterial to the sin of Sodom and Gomorrah. Um, Ezekiel specifically speaks to the fact that the inhospitality of Sodom and Gomorrah was actually much more of the sin than the homosexuality of it. And this also, the interpretation of homosexuality as a sin is not supported by most historical analyses. So it wasn't until much more recently in history that this became interpreted to be explicitly about homosexual sex as the sin. All right, moving along. Leviticus 18.22 and 20.13. I think this is probably the most famous clobber passage, uh, which is, do not have sexual relations with a man as one does with a woman. That is detestable. And its counterpart, If a man has sexual relations with a man as one does with a woman, both of them have done what is detestable. They are to be put to death. Their blood will be on their own heads. Bummer. (laughs) So I think the thing to unclobber Leviticus in this is we can talk about how these have been mistranslated and misinterpreted, but I think the other big question is, do any of us think or believe that the Bible dictates what we should do with our sexual and romantic lives because there are lots of commands and rules around sex and relationships and marriages that are very unpleasant um for instance the bible commands us to marry our dead brother or sister to marry within the same faith to abstain from sex until marriage and for women to be entirely subordinate to their husbands and many other weird laws and rules and whatnot. So I think if we take these as sort of and sit with them as these other laws of our own sex and relationships, we can sort of realize that maybe we shouldn't be using the Bible to dictate our romantic lives in as modern Christians, as modern people of faith. All right, Romans 1, 26 to 28. Because of this, God gave them over to shameful lusts. Even their women exchanged natural sexual relations for unnatural ones. In the same way, men also abandoned natural relations with women and were inflamed with lust for one another. Men committed shameful acts with other men and received in themselves the due penalty for their error. Furthermore, just as they did not think it worthwhile to retain the knowledge of God, so God gave them over to a depraved mind, so that they do what ought not to be done. So, In Romans, Paul also emphasizes the internal knowing of good and bad. So we know ourselves, for ourselves, what is good and holy. And if we are using our bodies in ways that are considerate, kind, and respectful, 
then we are living in grace, you know. And Paul also really in other parts of Romans that are concurrent with this one that should be taken along with this one is that nobody is good enough to judge anybody else. Um, and we'll talk a little bit more about Paul in this next one because this is also Paul. And so First uh, Corinthians and First Timothy, these passages are related. So First um, Corinthians is, or do you not know that wrongdoers will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived, neither the sexually immoral, nor adulterers, nor adulterers, nor men who have sex with men, nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor drunkards, nor slanderers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. Very much a mouthful. We also know that the law is made not for the righteous, but for lawbreakers and rebels, the ungodly and sinful, the unholy and irreligious, for those who kill their fathers or mothers, for murderers, for the sexually immoral, for those practicing homosexuality, for slave traders and liars and perjurers, and for whatever else is contrary to the sound doctrine. Okay, so in this one especially, it is unclear here what Paul meant, but what we do know is that generally speaking, we are called to a higher ethic than just these lists of do's and don'ts. Um, and to me, what unclobbers this and what unclobbers the previous passage in Paul is that we begin to miss the wider point that idolatry is the actual bigger issue here and hurting people and not doing what's good for ourselves is the bigger issue here rather than any specific action. And that also in terms of the structure of Paul's letters is probably a closer interpretation to what Paul meant. He wasn't listing the exact things that you shouldn't do. He was sort of making a point that we should know for ourselves and we should behave with a higher ethic. All right, in Genesis 1 and 2, I didn't put a passage here because it's kind of corny and known as Adam and Eve, not Adam and Steve. Um, so what unclobbers this one for me is in a closer reading, so A actually, what unclobbers this is knowing that Genesis is a myth and not history. It's always been intended as a myth. Um, historical analyses don't support a literal historical view of Genesis. Um, and so there's that aspect to unclobber. And then the other part that unclobbers is, or actually there's lots that unclobbers here. I'm getting mixed up. One of the other things that unclobbers and sort of pokes holes in the Adam and Eve, not Adam and Steve, is that Within scripture, there are many pairings that are not one man and one woman. Um, and then the last thing that I think is much deeper and deeply unclobber is this, is if you read the story very closely, Adam has lots and lots of agency in choosing his partner. God makes lots of companions for Adam. Adam says, no, God, this isn't for me. And only when God makes Eve does Adam say, yeah, this is good and they are a good pairing. And so in this, we can see that God trusts us to have the agency to choose our partners and to have that agency. And so that's what really unclobbers that passage and that rhetoric for me. And then I also wanted just to end this clobbering, pass this clobbering section with LGBTQ plus affirming scripture. It is out there. Um, I give you a new commandment that you love one another just as I have loved you. You should also love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. And so that's just one example. I also put a link here. You can quite literally Google LGBTQ affirming scripture and come across many websites that will take you through affirmational scripture. And there's also lots of pairings in scripture that are Frank, like LGBT pairings, you know, you think of uh, um, Ruth and Naomi and um, Jonathan and David and lots of these pairings that if you read it closely, you can sort of see this underlying potential romance or potential close companionship. But again, that is not necessarily why I am here. So I will leave that to rest. All right, and part three is a more affirming church. So in this, I wanted to just give a potential 
starting point for churches to maybe be on the road to being more affirming and just to give general ideas. Um, I don't think this is an exact roadmap in any capacity, so see what resonates with you and sit with that. Um, but first, I think the big question that I want you to sit with is if you think of your church as an affirming church, what feelings come up? Um, and I don't, don't, uh, don't negate any feelings. There could be a lot of hesitancy, there could be some fear, there could be discomfort. And I think to begin this work, you need to honor where you're at, you know, and you can't, you can't fake, fake it until you make it, I guess, in this regard. So some first steps after you know how you feel and maybe what your hesitancies and fears are is to sit with your congregation and ask how they feel and where they are on this journey. Um, because without the support of your congregation, this becoming an affirming church isn't really possible. You know, your congregation needs to be with you in this regard. Um, and this can be many forms. It doesn't have to be a whole big announcement on a Sunday morning. You can sit with individual members of your congregation and sort of take the temperature that way. It can happen in many different ways, seeing how your congregation feels. And then after that, honor where you're at with your congregation. Um, this isn't something, again, I can't stress enough how much this doesn't, isn't conducive to being forced. You know, you can't, as much as we want to try, the path forward to me is not necessarily forcing people to be affirming, you know? We want people to come to this themselves. Um, and then the other first steps is be explicit in your affirmation when it comes. Uh, know God loves everyone. That's a wonderful sentiment, but can be very profoundly unhelpful because that is vague enough to lead into circle, to lead into things like hate the sin, not the sinner, um, which is not affirming. Um, that is maybe on the right path, but still very harmful to LGBT Christians um, and invalidating. Uh, and so be explicit in your affirmations. God loves gay people. God loves transgender people because that'll likely, if someone's coming to you, that'll be probably one of the first times they hear those words. And that explicit affirmation can be very profound and very life-changing, especially coming from clergy. Um, and if anyone has more questions about that, let me know. Uh, post, and then the other first step is if your congregation is sort of warming to the idea or very on board is to host educational sessions with your congregation if and when you feel ready to do so. And I think this also circles back to my previous point of tolerance is not affirming. So God loves everyone is not affirming. Simple tolerance of we don't care if you're gay is not affirming. We don't care if you're transgender is not affirming. Um, affirming is we see and value who you are as a person and you are welcome in this community. Um, and is that, I hope that difference is clear. <laughs> and so more steps for when you sort of have gone through a lot of the initial steps are things like putting up a pride flag or other markers of affirmation for your community. Things like public displays like pride flags can be super important because even if it doesn't necessarily draw lots of LGBT people into your congregation, what it does do is it says that not all Christians are these strange, hateful people that if you want it, there is a place for you in a Christian community somewhere. Um, and that can be very affirming and can very much lead to people seeking out a home for their faith because many LGBT people feel lost in their faith. This is something that I've talked about with my friends who feel deeply hurt and lost and maybe they aren't ready to go back to church yet, but hey, seeing a pride flag outside of church would be a huge step for them. And then the other things that I think are very actionable to do is to reach out to your local LGBT organizations if they exist. Um, Wyoming is a very sparse state, sparsely populated, and so there might not be LGBT organizations organized where you live. However, um, 
PFLAG is very organized. And I know that there are lots of PFLAG chapters in and around Wyoming. And so your local community probably has a PFLAG that you can reach out to. Um, and then there's also local community colleges are very likely to have a GSA, which is a gay straight alliance or other kind of LGBT focused club. And if not, you may have to ask around and maybe use your own personal connections in your community to reach out to LGBT people and just to let them know that they are safe to come to your church. And even on the flip side, volunteering and getting members of your congregation to show up for PFLAG and for these local organizations and having that cross strength, you know, can be really important. Um, and again, because that might not necessarily get people in the doors of the church, but that can be one of the bridges. Um, and the other thing that I forgot to put on the slide is doing things like hosting a Pride Eucharist. Um, it's something that I've seen more commonly in many different churches around the country is hosting a Pride Eucharist. And there's many resources online for building a Pride Eucharist and whatnot, and you can find those online. Unfortunately, I did not put them on the PowerPoint, but they're easy enough to find. And then the last thing is to get on websites like gaychurch.org. Um, being on gaychurch.org, I think, happens after you have done the work to become an affirming church, and they have their own criteria. But I will say, this is not something you can just jump on and like get on and be on gaychurch.org. You have to have reflection and have to make that choice. But it is a really valuable resource that lots of people in the queer and gay community use to find churches that are affirming churches. Um, and so, yeah, I've actually used gay church before and will continue to use it in my life. And so, yeah. So that is the end of my presentation. Um, I will open it up to questions. And also, I will ask Alan if it is so doable to send out my email and if people have any questions after watching this recording later uh please email me uh i am a student and so i'm in our quickly but i will do my best to respond in the capacity that i can 